honesty, this is how you this is how you get recognized, this is how you just If you don't fill out one of these cards, you're not going to be you're not going to be addressed, you're not going to be recognized. So I'm gonna say it one more time. For those of you who may not be listening, this is better. Um, if you want to speak, you must fill out one of these cards. If you don't fill out one of these cards, you will not be recognized. Therefore, you will not be heard. Thank you.
war as a separate item. Frisbee is, is a, the, the no left turn on Frisbee is mandatory because they're extending the crosswalk, the island, so that people can cross the street. That was one of the big safety concerns in that intersection because there's been a tremendous amount of accidents in that intersection with pedestrians crossing. So they wanted to extend the island there, and that was the reason why this was done this way. Okay? You've seen the presentation twice now. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to ask that we move on at this point. Thank you.
to our last breakfast, we had over 300 people, and I must say, it is so well supported, and I'm so grateful to all the people in the community, because we have people from every part of our district. So the precinct, it looks from Castle Hill to Co op City, as does the community board, it's coterminous. So we're thrilled that we get people from each and every part of our community to get together for this event, to sit down together, to have a wonderful breakfast together, and to share in our appreciation of these wonderful community people and our police officers. So tickets are available tonight at $15 a piece. I have them, Amy has them, John, you have tickets with you. John Doyle has them. Uh, these are each members of the 45th Precinct Community Council. So anybody who needs them, please come on out. And anybody who wants to support by making a donation, we're more than happy to accept them. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
So if you come to the Bronx Museum, you will get a lot of information. 
that and get into the night. But he actually built this place so the people can have a comfortable way of retirement. Sure. Okay, sure. So what, what we're doing, we're doing our grand parents' ball, and it's doing Bronx Week. And our organization at ARG has honored 97 people from basically different communities. And this year, on this fabulous place, the Edmund Mansion, we will be doing a Japanese gospel concert. We have a Thai band. We will honor nine individuals from various communities. And we will be there from 1 to 8 p.m. So when you get an opportunity, please go to our website. We have a website that you can um, pursue and see all the great work that we're doing. And again, I do have flyers. I do have brochures about the event. And if you can stop by, please let us know. We'd love to have you. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone that uh, the speakers are limited to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Enrique Gemez. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to bring to your attention. I am a uh, property owner of 530 Rockstone Expressway. Now, there is an issue of speeding, and that is because of um, where Randall ends and meager ends. There, there are two lights, but any, in between those two streets, there is nothing. Um, I, was, I was hoping you guys would do what you did on the other side of the Rockland Expressway, and that's to put a couple of speed bumps. Um, there is better to Memorial Park right across the street, so, um, and with, with the spring coming, I think it would make us, the community safer. Actually, uh, there was a fatality there a couple of years ago, about five years ago, there was a fatality there. And this year, there were a total of seven accidents. And I'm talking about cars being robbed, just being hit by cars, and my, my car was one of those accidents. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, if you could um, come by our office and give us a petition requesting we would like to speak on from approximately half the people on the block telling us that they have no objection to this people being installed there, we can review it at our next municipal uh, next service meeting in May. Okay, thank you. Um, next speaker is Louis Rocco. It's not acceptable for our community. 
Now, what I believe is that something on board that they want to put new leaders on commerce, which is considered a commercial area. I want something, if it happens, for these cabs to have a, uh, a proper place to park. I've been in touch with their fleet owners out in Queens, and the cabs come, they're filthy, they dump and stuff. A solution should be brought. If something's on the table for this Vision Zero to work, just don't push bad things back in the community. And I'd just like to thank everyone, and let's work together. I think it's going to work out, but we've got to go slow. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, people.
next step is the Borough President's report. And that be Mr. Antonio. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening, everyone. Several quick announcements for those board members that are up for the appointment. Uh, letters will be going out last week in April, so you should be sending your letters uh, by the first week in May. Um, anyone that's in the general audience that applied for community board membership, uh, notification letters will be going out also that last week in April, so expect your uh, letters uh, that first week in May. Uh, last week, Bronx Week. Bronx Week is right around the corner. For those of you that don't know what Bronx Week is, it's a week-long celebration of our borough. It starts on Thursday, May the 7th, and concluding on May the 17th, on Sunday, May the 17th. Um, it's a week-long celebration of our borough. We have a lot of outdoor events, a lot of outdoor concerts. Uh, we have free travel rides from the borough. Uh, we also have uh, several uh, health fairs, indoor outdoor health fairs, um, and also we do some workshops businesses, nonprofit organizations, and so on. Um, to see the full itinerary of uh, the schedule, please visit ilovethebronx.com, and there you can see uh, the full schedule of the Bronx Week celebration. Um, any questions or concerns? Have a good night. <laughs> Next up is the district manager's report. Hi, I just want to uh, tell people that, you know, we have been working very hard with the Department of Public Services. Uh, we've heard that from us for months on uh, 555 Luxembourg Parkway, which is now the old Christmas place. Well, a number of good things happened. In addition, something else happened that was very good. One of the major things that we were able to accomplish, through the assistance of our elected officials as well, as the board, was to have a big, intrusive sign, two of them, uh, that said the free white stone hotel on the building taken down completely. They're gone. So now those residents within those buildings, within, within, I'm sorry, within the building, can enjoy a measure of security without being harassed by people who want to come into that place to utilize it for what it used to be utilized for. And so now those people are no longer being harassed. And they can go to their programs and they can hopefully move on. The other great thing that happened over there that we were told by the community, we were told by the show presence, that they thought it would be a good idea to have DHS police come in and patrol the building and to walk the perimeter. We had worked with DHS on that and we were able to secure that. So that was the <coughs> um, In addition, we have another homeless shelter over the area, which has been very quiet for many years. It's run by First Houses, it's called Town and Country. It used to be a motel, for those of you who live in Co-op City you might remember it as or missing spot. But anyway, uh, the, um, it's now been home for about 20 years. And they recently requested an opportunity to have DHS police come and visit them because they had some issues with some of their residents. And DHS has agreed to do that. So we went um, very far away with DHS from being basically stonewalled to just about getting everything we asked for. And we're very happy about that because we feel that we made some great inroads with that agency and we opened lines of communication with them on the board. And so we're able to do that as a board because we also, again, want to thank all the officials and their assistance in that board. So thanks, and that's my report.
back to us to give us a whole presentation. So I think it was about 8.45, the representatives from Tosca showed up for the public hearing, so we opened up the public hearing about 8.45. In the last 10 years, there's been numerous complaints about Tosca, about their the closed cafe, about noise, about uh, ballet walking, about a lot of things. So the short version is that the board voted it down and I had to go forward. I was killed at the public hearing. So the board did vote down that resolution not to support the renewal of the closed cafe at uh, Costas. So basically, that was the whole meeting.
They've lost the political license to steal power, right? Okay? Just too many problems with the location and just 
All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So in favor. After Hurricane Sandy, our board had received significant damage, not as much damage as communities in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island that we see, but nonetheless there was damage on City Island, there was damage on the Silver Beach, damage in Trucks, and damage in Edgewater Park, and up uh, Locust Point. One of the things that happened after, one of the things that happened after Sandy hit was that then they rumor had issued a report that was rather luminous commenting on various strategies that the city of New York was going to engage in in order to prevent storm surges. Now, what do we mean by storm surges? When the water level of Mount Severe rose to um, five or six feet and flooded the Holland Tunnel and the Lincoln Tunnel in Lower Manhattan, or when it rose to five or six feet and flooded um, places like Freezy um, Point and Queens and other we had that problem here, but we had, we were lucky because the wind took a shift and we didn't get the problem with it. But we were unlucky because we never really mentioned in the mayor's resiliency plan. So having seen that plan, we spoke among ourselves and we more developed an idea that we should have our own resiliency plan. And how do we go about getting that resiliency plan? We would have to produce our own study. So, we were very grateful, we were very lucky, very grateful to the borough president's office because we were given an opportunity once again to have a member of the Urban Fellows Group join our staff on a temporary basis to assist us in developing the resiliency study. And tonight, we're going to hear about that resiliency study and we're going to hear a resolution from the full board. The committee, with some services, had passed that resolution and now the full board is going to hear us to review it. And the idea behind the resolution study is so that we can develop plans to forward to the city outside the city administration regarding plans on how we can stop storm surges from doing the work damage to our communities that seem to be in the past. And we all know the issues are that we're going to have another safety life storm or even worse in the future. So we thought it was time to review, we thought it was important to review for the um, safety of our community. Marcel Lebrecht, who is our urban fellow from the Pratt Institute, and he's going to go over very briefly what the plan take. And many of you have wondered what the plan take now. Good evening, my name is Marcel Lebrecht. Thanks for having me here. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Mr. Prince, for the introduction. As you all know, we are at risk. Uh, it's a community board that is surrounded by water. Uh, so, uh, the New York City Panel on Climate Change estimates that the sea level will rise approximately two feet, two and a half feet by the year 2050. And when you add the FEMA maps or the storm surges for a hundred year uh, stern uh, floodplain, uh, you see that a lot of the board is at flood risk. Uh, including some neighborhoods that are not even considered uh, waterfronts. Uh, for example, Westchester Square, uh, which is surprisingly also uh, heavily flooded uh, in, in these in these uh, It's Also, southern portions of Co-op City, which as you of course know, it's, it's heavily, uh, it's very dense uh, and has a, a, a very large population, about 60,000 people. So, um, one of the first things that we did was just to conduct a survey to understand what was the uh, condition of the, uh, the shoreline. And we, and surprisingly, this was not, we didn't have this information. Uh, DOT didn't have that information, apparently, or the, C the Department of City Planning didn't have uh, a recent uh, survey of what was the infrastructural condition in terms of the revetments. Uh, the beaches, the tidal wetlands, uh, sea walls. So that was the first part, just doing the survey. And I think that was this one of the most important deliverables. And after that, we reviewed all the plans that are going. Um, so far, uh, the city has received over $4 billion from uh, federal uh, uh, aid. Um, uh, only $3 million have come through the New York Rising Program. 
So we can use those plans and those studies to document and understand what, what possibilities could happen and what could, would make sense. Uh, because of the environmental conditions, uh, we, there's a significant amount of tidal wetlands. So a strategy that's, that, that, that not only supports the community but also the environment uh, seems a feasible and effective way to mitigate storms. Uh, this is uh, also referred to as living shorelines or, or coastal green infrastructure. And it has been very successful in Massachusetts and Virginia. They're implementing this uh, uh, a lot. So this, a breakdown in this map uh, uh, would entail a larger percentage of living shorelines and living breakwaters. Uh, but also other types of strategies such as uh, perhaps a storage area for Westchester Creek, uh, um, floatable parks, uh, deployable flood walls, uh, and multiple other strategies. Uh, there's more details in the document. If you have any questions, I'll be more happy to uh, answer them. Um, I guess I just want to also to point out a major issue is uh, dredging spoils or uh, dredging uh, the navigation channels. And one thing that could be used for dredging these, these materials is using the, those sediments to create marsh lands uh, and living shorelines. So um, I don't know, I, I don't think that, that this is something that could be specifically addressed in, in that way. Uh, a larger study from, this, uh, from the corresponding seed agencies needs to be conducted. But hopefully with this uh, plan and, and with, with these recommendations, uh, further uh, uh, interest and in, 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 in studies can be conducted for the area to start moving forward and protect, protecting the shoreline. Um,
As I said earlier, this uh, proposal had been vetted before our municipal services committee, and now we're bringing it to the full board. So we have a resolution. This is resolved at the request of the municipal services committee of Bronx City Board 10 for the resiliency plan entitled Improving Resiliency in Bronx City Board 10 Protecting Vulnerable Coastal Ledges. A copy of this attached. Be approved that this information be presented to the full board. So. Resolved at the request of the Municipal Services Committee of Boston Community Board No. 10 that the component of the study covering Hutchinson River Parkway Service Road to Erickson Avenue was approved and that this information be reported to the full board. Thank you. 
spread the word to your group. Um, we really want to make our area more healthy, so we'd like to have more participation. Thank you. Thank you. 